Six years ago, I did something really strange. I joined a rare cancer patient support group on Facebook. And the reason that's really strange is I'm not a cancer patient. I'm actually a doctor who diagnoses cancer under the microscope. I'm a pathologist. And when I joined this group, I kind of just watched for a little while, watched the patients talk back and forth and have questions about their disease. And I, I decided one day to answer one of those questions, to reply to it. And I said, well, you know, I don't even know if I'm allowed to be here. I'm not a patient. I'm a doctor. I know about this type of tumor, um, but I'm kind of an outsider. And what happened next changed the course of my career. Um, this woman, uh, Pip, she's from the UK, and she founded this particular group. She said, uh, in the six years since I started this group, you are the first doctor, the first medical person of any type that joined this group and offered to help us or educate us. And that blew me away. And I don't think it's because doctors and medical people don't care, we care a lot. I think is that we just have no idea that patients are organizing themselves into these online communities in an attempt to get information and empathy and understanding about their disease, particularly for rare diseases. So Pip had a type of tumor called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. Uh, that's a long name, so we call it DFSP. And hers, unfortunately, was on her forehead. And it's a, it's a type of soft tissue cancer, a sarcoma that grows right under the skin. And she had to have this removed. The problem with DFSP, it doesn't usually kill patients, but it grows back, sometimes relentlessly, again and again. She had multiple recurrences, and I think around 20 surgeries spanning over uh, multiple decades. It's, it's, she's been dealing with this most of her adult life. She's still alive, but this has been a real toll on her. And um, I actually had a chance to meet Pip in real life. Um, she, uh, there was a patient um, meetup in the UK where the patients decided to get together and kind of meet each other and talk. And one of the patient members of the group offered to fly, bought a ticket to fly me and my wife all the way to the UK just so we could be there for that event because it mattered to them having a doctor, an expert in their disease, be in their corner, be in their group, be a champion for their cause. What a sense of, of meaning that was for me to know that it matters to patients that we're involved in these sort of things. Um, after Pip made me feel so welcome into that group, and I went on to join, I'm in about like 20 different rare disease groups. Now, I can't be as active in all of them. I only have so much time. But it really made me realize that a lot of patients want this kind of involvement from doctors. So what's my role in these groups? What do I do? Well, I don't give official medical advice. I am a doctor, and they are patients, but I'm not their doctor, and they are not my patients. But I understand the disease pretty well. So I can give them reliable, vetted information. I can answer general questions. I can help them understand uh, what we do to diagnose disease, how the process works. I can help them understand the terminology, the, the strange language that we use in medical reports. Very different than the way non-medical folks speak. And all of that, I think the goal being, is to help patients better understand their disease. Because it really has surprised me. I was worried when I joined. All oh, the people, people are going to ask me for medical advice. But most of the time, what the people want is to know why. They want to understand their disease. Even patients that are terminal and dying have asked me, why does this happen? Why did I get this? Did I do something to cause this? Something about having answers gives people a sense of empowerment and even a strange sense of peace, maybe. And if I can do something to help in that way, even though I'm not doing anything to cure them, I'm just giving them answers, well, that's time well spent in my book. This is the way that I volunteer in the little bits of spare time I have, five minutes here and there. So why me? Why not their own doctor? Well, for one thing, not all doctors know about all diseases. There is no way we can teach every disease that exists in medical school. I specialize in rare tumors, and there are still rare diseases and rare tumors that I've never seen or never even heard of that I learn about on a regular basis. It's a complex specialty, medicine is, and there's too much stuff for any one person to know. But many patients have said, my doctor had to go and, and Google the disease to find out what it even was. So even if their doctor knows about it and is really savvy, when you come into the doctor's office and they said, well, the biopsy results are back and unfortunately it's cancer, the world stops. I have cancer, I have cancer, I have cancer. That's all that you can think and you can't hear anything else. 
And once that shock wears off, the rest of the visit, there's a lot of stuff to do. Planning the scans to see if the tumor spread to somewhere else in your body. Getting follow-up appointments with oncology or radiation or, or surgery. All of the stuff that goes into to caring for cancer patients, it takes time and a lot of planning. And it may not be until weeks or months or even years later, at two in the morning, when you wake up and you think, am I gonna die from this? Who will raise my kids? Uh, you know, what is this new bump? Is this going to be, is the tumor coming back? This is the stuff that these people worry about. And at two in the morning, you can't call your doctor to ask him. But you can go on Facebook and you can post there and you may not get an answer right away, but you're going to get a group of other people that know exactly what you feel and what you're going through. And they're there to empathize and, and to support you. And I get to watch the patients do this and it's, oh, it's amazing. It's really amazing. It reminds me that one of those questions that came up, I was in a group and, and a woman, a mother, she was telling me about how her daughter was diagnosed with a type of cancer called synovial sarcoma um, as, when she was a teenager. And she said, you know, in our country, there's not a specialist in that type of cancer, but our oncologist, the one we found, he said, you know, this is a genetic tumor. There's a DNA problem that causes it. Uh, but unfortunately, testing your other children, it just would be too costly. And that's not actually true. There is no test. And I explained that to her. I said, no, it is a DNA problem, but it's only in the tumor cells. The rest of the cells in her body are normal, and it's not the type of uh, problem that you can pass on. It's not inheritable, um, even though it involves the tumor cell DNA. It's not something that you can pass on. So your other children don't have any more risk of getting this cancer than I do, or than anyone else does. And there is no test you can use to, to see if they have a risk for it. And she said, thank you. That's the clearest I've understood this in nine years since we met with that doctor, and I've always worried that we didn't have our other kids tested. Can you imagine? I'm a parent, I got three young daughters. Can you imagine the guilt for a decade over one bit of misunderstanding? You know how long it took me to answer that question? I was sitting in my car in a parking lot outside a store waiting for someone to meet me. Five minutes that would have been wasted otherwise. And I helped wipe away a decade of unnecessary guilt that that mom felt. How many other How many other people are out there like that, carrying un unneeded guilt and fear and worry because of misinformation? Information, even in 2020, there's a lot of it, but it's really hard to find the information that matters and to know that it's right for you. And so I feel like this is one little thing I can do to help with that. So this, this picture you're seeing now is, is another example of DFSP, also on the forehead in this patient is a different patient. And here's her, after her surgery, that the wound is packed, and that big swelling is not tumor, that's actually a tissue expander to stretch out the skin so there's more of it to help cover up that big hole that they had to make to remove all of it and get the margins clear around it. Now imagine, you know, you go in to have the final surgery to put it all back together, and then you take the bandage off and you're like, how's it gonna look? And you wake up looking like that. Can you imagine how that would feel? You know, um, what's really amazing to me is that the patients, they take these pictures and will share them with each other and say, I know this looks really scary now, mine did too, but look at me a year later when it's healed up and it looks great. Now, not everyone has that great outcome, but it's so awesome that the patients, cancer patients, are using their stories and the knowledge they've gained from working with their doctors and using that to share with other people in the group, new people who are newly diagnosed. This patient particularly, actually, she'll go back and pull old posts, old questions I've answered from years before, and use those and say, well, Dr. Gardner said this, and she'll use my own answers to help educate new people, saving me time and getting people the answers they need. You know, some days I leave the hospital and I'm tired and it's been a frustrating day and I'm grumbling and complaining and I think, oh, it's such a bad day. No, that's a bad day to deal with cancer. And those people can still find the time and the energy to use a little bit more to help other people in the midst of their own suffering. I got more to give. I can find a little bit more. It put a fire in my soul to do something more for these people. I've always cared about these types of tumors and I've always wanted to help sick people. I'm a doctor, that's why I do it. But you know, I never have to wonder if my job matters. I know it has meaning and value, and I'm exhausted and tired, but I am not burnout. And I really believe that this is a big part of why, because I know what I do has an impact, it matters. Before we go and talk about Cindy, I'll tell you that it's not all about education and, and making people feel better. We actually have done real research in these groups. One of the patients was asking a question once and I said, well, the literature is not clear. There's some studies say yes and some say no. And he said, look, 
there's hundreds of us in this group. Why don't you research us? And I thought, oh, the IRB ethics board that governs research, you're going to love it when I say, let's do a Facebook research study. Well, lo and behold, they did love it, and not because it was a brilliant idea I thought of, but because a patient suggested it. And the idea of a patient backing this and being behind it, of having the buy-in from the patient community and their support, that was cool. That's patient-centered research. It's kind of a hot new thing. And what was incredible is that actually five patients from the group became co-researchers with us. They did all the ethics training. They had like Skype calls with my resident, Dr. Marjorie David, who really, if it wasn't for her, this would never have gotten done. It would have been a great idea that would have still been on my list of things to do when I was retired. But she made it happen. She kept pushing. And I remember her sitting on Skype calls with these patients and them hammering out what the survey would say to ask questions so they could find answers to what the patients wanted to know about their own disease. The stuff the doctor said, we don't really know the answer. And the patient said, fine, we'll find the answer. It's a group of 2,000 patients now in that DFSP group. It's the biggest group of those patients in the world. And when we did the survey, the survey got 200 patient responses in three weeks. I would challenge the biggest cancer centers in the world to pull that off. We pulled it off because we had the buy-in from the patient community. We had their support. And we published that last year. And the coolest, most awesome thing to me, I've published a bunch of papers. That was actually my 100th paper, which I thought was particularly cool and meaningful. But on the front page of a medical paper, there's the title. And then under it is the list of all the authors. And right there next to my name, those five patients. Not research subjects. Colleagues, co-authors, equals. What can I publish that's better than that ever? What can mean more, be more amazing than that, than to partner with patients? And who's a more vested, more interested researcher than someone who suffers from the disease or a parent whose kid suffers from the disease? We are missing out in medicine because we are not partnering with these people. We need to change that. This is Cindy. I never met Cindy, not, not online and not in real life either. I found out about her because I was giving a lecture to some other pathologists, and I was going to talk about her disease, angiosarcoma. And I, I'm in the angiosarcoma group as well. It's a rare, pretty aggressive blood vessel cancer. And I asked the patients, I said, would any of you be willing to share pictures of your tumor? Because it usually occurs on the skin, and people have smartphones, right? I said, could you share pictures so that I can use to educate other doctors? And in like two days, I got this flood of pictures in my inbox. It was out of control. More pictures than I would have gotten in my whole career the traditional way, because the patients had them, and they said, please, please, please share these. Use these to help get patients diagnosed sooner, to help educate your colleagues. And of all the pictures, Cindy's stood out to me the most. This is a picture of the tumor basically involving all of the skin on the side of her face, her ear, and, and I got one other picture which I can't show you because it's just too graphic, it's too terrifying. I only show it to select audiences that are used to seeing these things. And a group of pathologists, a room full of people who have seen very graphic things, like me. In our career, we see bad stuff. I showed them her picture, and it was of the tumor eating all the way through, the whole side of her face gone, all the way down to bone. And she died a few, few weeks after that picture was taken. And you could hear the gasps, the intake of breath, how shocked and horrified people were. And I emailed her husband, who sent me the pictures, his name's Dave, and I said, Dave, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but I, I guess I will. I, I just want you to know that Cindy's pictures had an impact on this audience today that they will never, ever forget. And he wrote back and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I had, took me three attempts to read your email because I was crying so hard and I couldn't see through my tears anguish at what she went through, but also joy at the fact that through her suffering, something good will come. It won't be in vain. I've met Dave in person. I've met, I've met his, his and Cindy's adult daughters. I've met their family. These aren't just people that I know online. These are my friends. They're like my family now because I'm able to share the story of their loved one who passed away to audiences. I'm able to carry on her story in a way that adds value and is meaningful. And that means a lot to them. And Dave and this woman, Lori, who lost her husband to angiosarcoma of the heart, they both met because of their spouse's disease. Their spouses both died. They both drove from Houston, Texas to Little Rock, Arkansas. That's like a seven-hour drive just to meet me and say hi. And we stayed up late talking about what it was like to go through that experience and, and how Facebook groups are going to change the way that we help rare disease patients. And they went back home the next day. And during that 
14-hour road trip, they started talking about dating, and I do like to take a little bit of credit as being a matchmaker for them. <laughs> and two years ago, yeah, they got married, and that little girl, that's Cindy's uh, granddaughter who she never met. Angie Osarkoma took that from her and from her family, but despite the terrible things that brought them together, the worst thing in their life, probably, the death of their spouse, they found joy and hope and, and love and happiness on the other side. These patients have taught me a lot that I didn't know about cancer, even though I'm an expert in these diseases. But I think more importantly, they've taught me a lot about life, about what matters. It's been a powerful experience to know these people and to hear their stories and to be able to do something to help them. If you have breast cancer, or colon cancer, or something that's common, it's a bad thing, but you can find information and support because there are lots of people in every community that have those diseases. But if you have a rare cancer like angiosarcoma, there might not be but a couple people in your city or even your state that have been diagnosed with that. One patient in this group told me that it was 30 years before he met another person who had angiosarcoma. That's a lonely place to be, a really lonely place to be, to have people not understand, to have to explain yourself again and again. And I think Facebook groups can change that. They can bring these people together no matter how rare the disease is. And what if every rare disease had its own Facebook group? And what if that group had a team of doctors partnered with it to provide vetted, reliable information and to learn from the patients? Imagine the partnerships for, for research and for advocacy and education, partnerships that the patients themselves have ownership in. How powerful would that be? And it's free. Yes, it takes time and organization. It takes a willingness to think outside the box and a willingness for us to step outside our comfort zones and the traditionally defined boundaries of where doctors should be and patients should be. I don't think it'll solve all the problems in medicine, but I think it will move the needle in a positive direction. So what's my ask of you? Well, if you're in this audience and you or a loved one have a rare disease, look on Facebook and see there might be a group there that you could join and it might actually help you in a lot of ways you wouldn't imagine. And if there's not one, Maybe you can make one. It's not too hard to make a group. When Pip started her group back in 2008, I don't think she imagined that I'd be standing here talking about on a TED talk and showing her forehead and talking about the change she made on my career, but it did. If you are a doctor or a medical professional, consider joining a group. Just five minutes a week could make such an impact on people's lives and on your life. And if you're Mark Zuckerberg or one of the executives of Facebook and you happen to be watching this online in the future, I want you to know that your groups are making a change for rare disease patients. And I think Facebook could do more to strengthen and support those groups and encourage collaboration with medical professionals. And if you do that, I'm the first to volunteer. I will help you however I can because it will change people's lives. And I'll tell you this for sure. It has changed my life forever. Thank you.